Put some things on the on the board. I don't know who can read it. After today, you will know what it is. Um, it's also another language I'm uh, very uh, familiar with. I'm learning bits and bytes every now and then, um, as the Lord leads. Uh, I want to talk about um, our faith. Who, what do we believe? Who do we believe in and why? Uh, sometimes we lose track. We, we do our thing, but we don't really know why. <laughs> it must be good, it's God, but why is all this? And so I first want to go to uh, Colossians chapter 1, uh, where Paul gives a beautiful verse. It's beautiful if you just read it the way it is written, but... About an hour from now, you will see it is even much more beautiful and profound than you would have imagined. And this is, shows how Paul was writing, led by the Spirit. Uh, Colossians 1, verse um, 15 through 18. <coughs> he writes there about his Lord and Savior, who is also our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And he says... And he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Now, I will read on, but if you read this for yourself, you should stop there and you should think, what does this mean? Who is the invisible God and how did he become the image? Every word has so much in it, but I will read on for now. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. By him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. Wow, <laughs> this is massive what is written here. This is massive. Actually, if you really know this, it's all you need to know. Very profound. It speaks about Jesus. Uh, often we say Yeshua, which is good, that's, that's actually the biblical name. Um, and, and it has, of course, uh, it, it gives the direct um, meaning of, of his purpose, of who he is. And we say then in, in Hebrew, hey, Yeshua HaMashiach. Ha means the. Unfortunately, the. So, Jesus, Jesus, eh, the Messiah. Jesus, the, the Messiah. That's what it means. Messiah is, again, it's a Hebrew word, Messiah. It's not English. Uh, Messiah means the anointed, the anointed of God. It, he is the one that God has anointed for a purpose. And so when we say in Greek, uh, Jesus Christos, O Christos, it's the same. Jesus, the Messiah. O Christos is also it's the Savior, or the, 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 yeah, the Messiah. Let's keep it simple. <laughs> so it's the same name. That is the substance of our faith. We always speak about Jesus. We love Jesus, we follow Jesus, and we are saved by and through Jesus. He is the substance of our faith. But why? Why? Why is this so? And the short answer is that he is the one who delivers. He is the one who saves. He is the one who reveals. He is the only way to the Father. So without him, we are lost. We are dead. We have no access to the Father whatsoever. 
no way. And Jesus says, I am the, the way, the truth, the life. There's no way to the Father except through me. So, that's the why. <laughs> it's the only way. But uh, it's not because we don't have any other option. It's because of what he did for us to open this way. That is massive. That's why I gave you this card. It's not just to make some promotion, but if you get this, if you really get this, then you, you're there. <laughs> yeah, there is, I have you know, on, on the cover of my Bible, John 3.16, For God so much loved the world. You know this very much. That's this. But if you read that, for God so much loved the world. God loved the world. He loves the world. Why does he love the world? He created it. It's his creation. And he created it because he wanted to. Because this was his desire. He loves it. But what does the world do? What do we do in return? We don't love him back. We don't love him back. How painful is that? Uh, there are many children here, so there are many parents, and you know, you love your child. But if your child does not love you back, if there is only rejection and hatred, that hurts. That hurts. God loved the world so much that he did what? He gave. He gave. I stop there, because that is what love is all about. Love is about giving. Love is selfless. This, in this world today where we live, this is lost. All the love that you see outside is selfish. It is always what is in it for me. And if there's nothing in it for me, goodbye. I don't need you. God's love is selfless. God created us. So if we were not what he wanted us to be, he could just wipe us out and create something else. He's God. He can do that. But he loves us so much that he gave. What did he give? His only begotten son. What does that mean? He became like us. The failures that we are, he became like us. The same weakness, the same pain, the same anger, the same hurt, everything that we can experience, he also experienced. And more, yes. Much more, actually. Because he took all this dirt upon him from all men throughout all time. <laughs> On top of that, this was the biggest sacrifice. He separated from the Father. God loves us so much, he wants to always reach out to us. He reaches out to us all the time. Jesus had a perfect relationship with the Father, yet... He separated himself from the Father. The Father separated his Son from him and crushed him. That is massive. He gave. Why did he give? If you read the rest of the verse, why did he give that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life? He gave his Son so that he, after that, could give more, namely eternal life. If you think of that, that's love. You give not in order to receive, in order to be able to give more. That is selfless love. It is, you really have to think about this. And yeah, If it doesn't give you goosebumps, something's wrong. So what is the goal of our faith? To be with our Father. And Jesus is the way. Uh, King David, um, he, he got it. It is amazing. We, we often stumble upon verses where you see how he understood, without having the revelation, he understood that God brought salvation. Salvation from God in Hebrew is Yeshua. Shua is salvation. Yah is Yahweh is God. He understood Yeshua without knowing Yeshua. He understood that he, his sins were, were dirt, and that it had to be cleansed, and that it could only be cleansed through blood. He got all that. And he writes in Psalm 27, verse 4, he, he sums up, why do we believe? Why do we believe? So it's a beautiful verse. He says, one thing have I desired of the Lord. One, one thing that I will seek after. Namely, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. This place, this earth, is not where we want to dwell all the days of our life. And I'm speaking about our eternal life. No, in the house of the Lord. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord. To behold the beauty of the Lord. Some people uh, love art and they buy a painting. They pay fortunes to acquire a painting. They put it on the wall and they just sit and they watch it. And they can do this for hours and the next day again, etc. To behold the beauty of the Lord is a million times more than that. A million times more than that. All the days of my life. And to inquire in his temple. That is why we believe. We have this home before us. Now, if we talk about Jesus and about the gospel, we usually go to the New Testament where all is being revealed. And um, I think it's actually in, in this book, Wake Up, where it says the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So it, it clarifies a lot, of course. But at the same time, um, it is also very beautiful to see how God has given everything in the Old Testament everything and if you connect these these dots so to speak there is such a beautiful uh, message and, and, and that this love is emerging so i want to go and i want to to go to get the plan of um, of god with his creation with us with mankind his plan of salvation through his son i want to read this whole plan from one verse in the old testament from one verse, and it's the first verse in our Bible. The very first verse, Genesis 1 verse 1, holds the whole thing, everything. All the rest of the Bible is, is summed up there. God is not so mysterious. He gives away the, the plot right away in the first verse. He says, this is what I'm going to do. And then you can read the, all the 66 books. And you will see that it's just explaining what he gives there. So that's what I wrote here. It's the first verse of the Bible. <coughs> Bereshit, in the beginning, Farah, uh, Elohim, et Hashamayim, Vayet, Haresh. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We read this and we say, okay, God created the heavens and the earth. Move on, verse 2, what's there? But you have to really stop here. This is very deep. Especially if we take uh, the meaning from the characters here, from the Hebrew. So the obvious, what it says, is that God created the heavens and the earth. That's already quite, quite something. <laughs> he created everything. The God we believe in is the creator of everything. There's nothing higher. As we read from, uh, from Colossians 1, uh, uh, everything is held together by him. He was before everything. There is nothing outside him. Nothing can exist outside him. Nothing can happen outside him. That's massive. This God became man. And, and I make a little side jump now. But um, we looked at um, a while ago at uh, Matthew 13. Jesus gives there um, several parables that all have to do with somehow with agriculture, with seeds and sowing and fields and all this. One of them um, is, is about a treasure in the field, a man that finds a treasure in the field. So he explains later in the chapter what the meaning is, what is the field, what is the man, the sower, all these things. And from this you can understand that the man who finds the treasure is Jesus. And the treasure it's us. It's the church. That's his treasure. And he gave everything to get that. He gave up his relationship with God. This he broke. And he died. So, that's what it's saying. But then the next parable, which is just one verse, is very similar, but it's about a pearl in the field. So you think, well, okay, he's just saying the same thing twice so that we understand better. No. It has a meaning. Because a treasure is like 
most of us imagine a treasure chest that you open and it's full of all kinds of uh, valuable things. So each of us are all these valuable things and together we are the treasure. But the pearl is just one thing. You cannot divide it. It's one thing. So what is he saying there? That that's you. You are the pearl. And you are the pearl. You are the pearl. You. So that, now he's becoming very personal. He's saying, I found you. Nothing exists in the universe but you. And he says, I gave up everything for you. So if you think of this, he would have done the exact same thing. He would have died the same way if only you existed. That's love. And that's the creator of the universe who does this. So, that's the obvious thing. But there is several things you can uh, deduct from this. Maybe I should for uh, this this letter means in this is uh, beginning um, <coughs> created. That I will not translate. Elohim, God. This has no meaning. Uh, Hashemayim means the heavens. It's plural, eh? Shamayim, everything that ends in im is plural. Hashemayim, ha is with the, so the heavens. Okay. The heavens. This letter means end. These two have no meaning. And this means earth. Haresh. I think there is also an Israeli newspaper called Haresh. It means earth. The world. <coughs> so, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What do you see? You see three things. You see beginning. If you talk about beginning, we began this, this service at a certain moment in time. Beginning has always to do with time. So here is time. The heavens, that is... The unseen realm, that's space. What we would scientifically call space. The earth is all the matter. So we have time, space, and matter. Now, 103 years ago, 1915, Einstein came to this thought that there is a space, time, continuum. There is space, time, and matter. And that makes up everything. Well, here it is. God was before Einstein. Um, but the first letter there is the Beth. And the Beth we mostly, all of us know, from the Bethlehem we know it means house. Eh? Bethlehem is house of, of bread. Le Lechem is bread. So it means a house. But here it means in, because you build a house because you want to be inside. Not, to, not to stay outside, you live in the house. So it has the meaning in, in this this way, used in this way. But every letter, I have to say, every letter is also a word. So the letter Beth is just a letter, but the word Beth means house or household. Household. So the interesting, the first thing that God does, the very first letter in the Bible, <coughs> it says basically, this book is about my household. And now he's going to tell what's inside his house, household, what belongs there. So then we get the word Rashid, which means beginning. And so again, it's, it's time, but it's also, it also means the, uh, the best, the finest moment. So he didn't create everything sometime in the beginning, but he created everything at the best, at the finest moment. It could not have been a better timing than that. We cannot understand this because as far as we are concerned, there was nothing before. We cannot wrap our, our minds around this, but this is what it says. This is what it means. God created the heavens and the earth in the finest moment. And, but there is more to it. There is here a, um, a three letter root. All the Hebrew roots, by the way, are three letters. It's a whole other story, but okay, let me not digress. 
it's there's a, a word there that is rosh or resh. The word reshit beginning is derived from the word rosh, which means head or first or start, but it also means sum. So if you sum up everything or do a simple calculation, one plus one, the sum is two. So that's the the rush of this calculation. It's the sum. It's where what, how you sum everything up. So again, he says, "This is my household. I'm gonna sum up what it is." Okay. The word rush is such a profound word because it explains right away what it's all about. As it means head or even prince or chief, king, although there's a separate word for king, but king in the sense of the head of the, the state, uh, it's all the same word. Uh, if you ever uh, see the Israeli news, and you, you will see the Knesset, you will see uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu sit there, they have a little uh, name uh, card in front of them, you will see where Netanyahu sits, it begins with Rush. he's the head of the Knesset, and then follows his name. So you will recognize these three letters. Anyway, so that, that's what it means. But in scripture, it always points to the head of the church, which is Jesus. So the household of God is all about Jesus. He's in it. So that's where scripture begins. He's in it. And there is a few verses where this comes out uh, very beautifully. Uh, one is in Psalm 118, verse 22. It's also a very famous verse because Jesus quoted that verse in Matthew 21, verse 42. And with doing so, he explained that that's about him. That's why he quoted it. Uh, it says that the stone which the builders refused or rejected is become the headstone, or other translations say the chief cornerstone of the, of the corner. Right? It's become the chief cornerstone, the headstone of the corner. And that word, if you read this verse in Hebrew, is Rosh. That's what it says. And so, in Matthew, Jesus says, this is about me. So he is the Rosh, he's the head. So there we, we see, by Jesus' own words, he connects this word with himself. In Psalm 119, in verse 160, it's very much towards the end, there is also a beautiful verse, but it's a bit difficult translated. Uh, you don't recognize so much of it. It says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So, thy word is true from the beginning. That is how King James uh, says it. It says actually, um, I wrote it down somewhere. <laughs> it says, the rosh of thy word is truth. The head of thy, the head, the sum of thy word, everything sums up in truth. That is what it says in Hebrew. And it uses the word rosh again. Now Jesus says, I am the truth. So everything sums up in Jesus. It's also what this says. Everything sums up in him. He is the truth. And that's the word. He is also the word. See how everything goes together beautifully. So that's, that's rosh. Now, Psalm 119, um, some Bibles uh, divide these, these uh, 176 verses into groups of eight verses. Uh, it's called an uh, acrostichon, this, this type of poetry, which means that for every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, there is one or more verses. In Psalm 119, you have eight verses for every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which are 22 letters, so eight, time, eight times 22 you come to your 176 verses. Uh, yeah, verse. Now, uh, verse 160 is under the letter, guess, it's not difficult, under the resh, yeah, under the letter rosh. Verse 160 of Psalm 119 is under the letter rosh. See, so it is there, it has there its place, where everything summed up. God is perfect. How many words has this verse? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah? Seven words. Now, if God, uh, if you can say God has a fingerprint, then it is seven. Seven is the number of completeness, and uh, God works always in sevens throughout Scripture. I have uh, somewhere a list. I don't, I'm not going to read the whole list, but 
let me just give you a few uh, things. Uh, uh, of course, uh, he created uh, everything in six days, and the seventh day was the rest. So the week is therefore determined as seven days. So there you have your first seven. Actually, here you have your first seven, but anyway. <laughs> um, and then you have, um, um, I will skip some things. Uh, you have seven uh, high holidays, as are defined in Leviticus 23. Um, and several of them also in incorporate seven days, or a multiple of that, uh, between uh, first fruits and uh, Shavuot Pentecost is seven times seven days plus one day. Um, then you have the word created. This word, in relation to God, is used in the entire Bible seven times. Noah took animals into the ark. Not two by two, as we mostly think, that were the unclean, but the clean animals, seven by seven. Sevens. Yeah, we, we always have this two by two in our heads, but actually, if you read it, you see this were only the unclean animals. Um, seven days before the flood came, Noah was called into the ark. Before Aaron and his sons could enter the tabernacle, they had to be purified. Seven days. Um, okay, I will skip again some things. There's so much. <laughs> um, Jericho, yes. Seven days they walked around the city one time, and on the seventh day they walked around the city seven times. Uh, Solomon built the temple in seven years. Job had seven sons. Um, and when all calamity came and his friends came to him, they sat in silence for seven days and seven nights, and then they had to bring a sacrifice, which were seven bullocks and seven rams. Um, now Ammon had to wash himself seven times in the Jordan before he was healed. Ah, yes. <laughs> uh, Jesus spoke seven words from the cross. Okay, I skip again some things. Um, the book of life, the phrase, the book of life, is used in the entire Bible seven times. And then we have the book of Revelation. This is the, the sum of everything. It's a book of sevens. Seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven uh, personalized, seven characters, seven uh, balls, seven dooms, seven new things, seven... Uh, these, now I mentioned seven sevens. Uh, and so it's a com book of completion. And, and that it, by the way, has 22 chapters is also not by chance. This is the 22 characters of the alphabet. We get to 22 here as well. But not, I want, don't want to digress too much. So, Jesus said, forgive not one time, not two times, 70 times, seven times. In other words, seven is the number of completion. Keep on forgiving until it is completed. Until it is completed. Not, I say, for, uh, I forgive you and I've done my duty. If it's not completed, you have to continue. So, okay, it goes on seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, etc., etc., etc. There's so many. So this is, God works in sevens. Tribulation period will be seven years. Now this verse is the only verse in the Bible that has seven characteristics of seven in it. What does that mean? Well, one characteristic we mentioned, that's that it has seven words. That's one characteristic. If you count the characters, and actually I wanted to ask Sana to do it before, but I forgot to ask, so now you don't need to do it. But if you count the characters, you will find out it are 28 characters. Seven times four. It's a multiple of seven. If you take out the three nouns, which is God, heaven, and earth, and you count the characters of that, it's 14. So th th that what it's really about. It's, yes, it's always multiples of seven. So the other seven, of, of course, it's also two times seven. Now the shortest word is this word that doesn't mean anything. Well, I say this lightly. I will get to this in a minute. Don't worry, I'm up to something. <laughs> <laughs> this is two, two letters. The word before it, Elohim, God, is five, so this makes a seven. The word that follows it is Hashemahim, the heavens, is also five. So 
this, this makes again seven. God and the heavens. It is two times seven. But it's connected. It cannot be separated because otherwise it's not seven. You're already uh, processing. Very good. Um, <laughs> Now, there is another interesting thing with, um, with Hebrew language. Um, every letter is also a number. So in the Hebrew language, just like in the, in the ancient Greek, there are no numbers. They use letters also to represent numbers. So the first letter, the Aleph, our A, is number one. The second, the Beth, is number two. The Gimel, three, Dalet, four, etc. And yeah, the Chet is eight. Yeah. The number of grace. And so um, until uh, 9, obviously, and then you get uh, 10, 20, and then you get higher numbers. So if, if you look at the numbers, let me use another color. You get it. Then um, what many uh, Hebrew scholars and scribes do, they, they don't just read what it says, they also see what it what it adds up to. So I've also learned to do this. Often uh, I'm playing with these numbers and seeing what comes out and everything. It's, it's very profound. But So every word, if you add the letters of the word, so the, uh, for example, these three uh, letters have each a numeric value. If you add it up, you get the value for the word. Okay. So if I take, and we'll not write everything, but for example, the earth is a number, uh, if you add it up, it's 296. Uh, the heavens is uh, 395. Uh, God, 68, uh, 86. Created is uh, 203. Okay. <coughs> Enough. <laughs> Now, if you look at, uh, again, the three, uh, the three nouns, uh, Elohim, Hashemim, and uh, Haresh, the three nouns are 14 characters. If you add up these numbers, what do you get? 777. Seven, seven. I'm telling you, it's not by chance. And there is one verb. That's the word created. As I said, it's used seven times in the Bible in relation to God's creative work. And it has the value 203. And 203 is 7 times 29. 7 times 29. So we have again a 7. But 29, if you do 9 minus 2, it's again 7. So these are seven characteristics of the number 7 that are all in this, um, in this one verse. And as far as we know, there's no other verse in the Bible that has this. And it shows how important this is. And how God wants to emphasize this for those who have eyes to see. So we have seven as the number of God, the fingerprint of God. Now every number in scripture also has a meaning. So seven is the number of God. Three, for example, has everything to do with the resurrection. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. It also points to the Trinity of God, but first of all to this. The number 10, for example, points to the law. There are 10 commandments. So every number has a meaning. And you can always find a meaning in, in the Bible itself. So there is another thing that you can, can find out, another layer of meaning that you can find. And you see how awesome our God is. Um, and how perfect in everything, every detail. And th th this is its not just funny science, but it shows he works... Minutely, uh, how do you say? Minutiously, eh? to the detail, very precisely. And this is how he wants to work in your life. People often think, uh, oh, God, okay, when I'm in problems or uh, eh, I really need, okay, I will say a prayer or ask him if he will bless this or that. No, he wants to work in every little detail of your life, every little thing. That's the way he works. That is God. <clears throat> It's not just somebody, it's God, <laughs> the creator of the universe. So there is another number that is very important that I will come back to, uh, and that's the number six. On the sixth day, what did God create? Man, yes. So six is the number of man. Throughout scripture, six is the number of man. 
Unfortunately, we are not as good as God. This is the number of completion and perfection. This is not. It's also the number of, number of sin. That's us. Okay? Um, and that's why you see it um, among other places in the book of Revelation as the number of the beast, 666. It's the accumulation of sin. Of all the bad stuff that we have. <laughs> so, but it's basically the number of men. Now, um, I want to go back to the first verse we read from Colossians uh, 1, verse 15 through 18, because now we're going to see something that is extremely profound. This is written by Paul, and he has written it in Hebrew, in um, Greek. <laughs> but if it were in Hebrew, it would be something quite different. Um, we're not going to read it in Hebrew, but I'm going to give some hints. Uh, of course, Paul knew Hebrew. I don't know. I don't know whether he has this had this in mind or was simply led by the Spirit, and this is how it came out. Either way, this is this is uh, how it's in our Scripture. It says, "And he is the image of the <coughs> invisible God, the firstborn." In Hebrew, that would be Rosh. Okay. Now. I'm going to, that's the first we find. It continues, firstborn of all creation. That's that, right? Eh? It's the first. First in the household. The firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, the heavens and the earth, and visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is, he's what? He's before all things. What is that? Rosh, Rosh, before, first, that's the second one. And in him all things hold together. He is also the what? The head of the church. That's Rosh, the head. Okay. In Hebrew this would all be the same word. That's why I'm saying. Head of the church, and he is the what? The beginning. Which is? Beginning. Which again, Rosh. He is the what? The firstborn from the dead. What is firstborn? Rosh. It's five. So that he himself might come to have the what? The first place. In everything. How many Rosh do we have? Six. In order to be this for us, he had to become man. There's no seven, there's six. To go from seven to six, you have to come down. You have to take something away. He laid off his divinity. He became man. That is the, the hidden message, if you want, the concealed message in this few verses, which is extremely profound, and this only God can do this, of course. There's more, don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Yes. <clears throat> so, now we have here the Vav. The Vav means end. If it's used only as one single letter, it means end. As we have the word N, just to connect things. The heavens and the earth. That's what Vav means. Now the first time it is ever used in the Bible is here. There's no Vav preceding it. This is the first time. If you would count on which position it is, you would find it's on the 22nd place. That's why I said before, it's not by chance that um, the book of Revelation is 22 verses and it's a book of sevens. This is a verse of sevens, it's, we saw. And on the 22nd place is the Vav. Now if you divide 22 by 7, you get uh, pi, P, you know, 3.14, uh, etc. That shows the completeness. It is full, but it can only become full with the Vav. What is the Vav in the alphabet, in the Hebrew alphabet? Which position is it? Yeah, but what, what number does it represent? Yeah, six. Six. It's on the six position. So the number six is necessary to make this full circle. Here it is six on the 22nd place, and when we see it in, in for you I have to do it the other way around, <laughs> in Revelation it is seven, 22 divided by seven. So you see what God has done. Okay. There it's completed. Yes, it's finished. 
the, it will come out uh, better even. So the 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 word "end" here is in between two: the heavens and the earth. It connects the heavens and the earth. What does Jesus say? There is only one way to the Father, and that's through me. He says, "I am the way. I connect us, the earth, with the heavens, with the Father. He is that that bridge that connects the heavens and the earth." How did he do that? By becoming a man through six yeah. the number of men. But there's more. You said it already. The vav, actually the word vav, which is written with two two vavs, the word vav means nail. How did he become, how did he make this bridge? Not only by becoming man, but by being crucified, being nailed to the cross. That is what it what it's, uh, means there. So God's plan of salvation is here. He created the heavens and the earth, but he knew already from the beginning he needed also to provide a way for us to access heaven. He knew already then the end. As it says in Isaiah, he knew the end from the beginning. And he had prepared everything. This story is actually summed up in, in another letter, which is the Aleph, which is the first letter. Aleph, this is where our A comes from. The Aleph is... Uh, <coughs> It's a funny letter. It has this this line, and then um, a thing going up, and it looks a bit like an X, but it's not. Uh, it's actually compound character. They say this this uh, little uh, tail going up and the one going down is is a yod. It's this letter. So it's one upside down yod and one points down. One points to the heavens and one points to the earth, and in between is the connector. This is the vav. It's made up of three letters, two yod, two times the yod, and one times the vav. So this first letter of the Hebrew alphabet also tells the story of the gospel. It's Jesus and it is his sacrifice that makes the, the connection, bridge for us to heaven, the, the way to the Father. Interesting thing is that if you have a yod and a yod and a vav, the yod has value 10. You get 26. You would say, oh, so what? Well, <coughs> if you write Yahweh, God, that's the Yod He, Vav He, so that's 10, 5, 6, 5. You add that up, and you will see it's 26. So, Jesus is also God. He became man, but he's also God. This is not, uh, not he, he sits at the right hand. He's the King of Kings. So, we see all this is in there. I want to go to another verse in the New Testament, um, which also speaks, again, Paul writes about Jesus in 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. And you, I hope you see through this how, I think we said it last night when we were talking, this, this, this is not a book. This is not a book. This is a treasure cove. When you open it, you see all these these pearls and gemstones and, and golden coins and, and you can dig in it and see the beauty and all the time you discover new things and everything is, is more beautiful than what you saw before. That is what scripture is. And our lives are too short to, to find out everything. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. <clears throat> it's again a beautiful um, verse about Jesus. It says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Again, you have to take time to really think through what it says here, but let's, let's count again. I've also learned to read, the Bible is full of lists, listing things. It always counts. Let's see what this does. God was manifest in the flesh, that's one. He was justified in the spirit, two. Seen of angels, three. Preached unto the Gentiles, four. Believed on in the world, five. Received up into glory, six. He had to become man to do all this. And to be this to us now. It's very interesting that, that we find this here. And if we go to Revelation, and uh, yeah, you followed it, obviously. Uh, on YouTube we, we have a, a series of studies, not finished yet. But you see, you come all the time up to sevens. And here, it's the sixes. 
Here we are talking about Jesus' work on earth that he did for us. In Revelation, we talk about his completed work. He's now in heaven. So, not by chance. See, this, this verse now gets an, an extra dimension. Okay, I don't want to take too much time. Um, there is one word there that doesn't mean anything. I said, there's no translation. Also here we find the Aleph and the Taf. They are meaningless. Um, in the syntax of the language, they have no meaning. There are different uh, opinions by uh, linguists and, and Hebrew scholars of what it might mean. But actually no one really understands why it's there. But it's there. Here, throughout the whole Old Testament you find many times this, this uh, two letters. Now, if you go to Revelation 1, verse 8, Jesus appears to John, and Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the, uh, the Alpha and the Omega, or capitalized. Yeah, that's in Greek. But what is the Alpha and the Omega? It's the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Yeah, so in, in het Nederlands zou hij gezegd ik ben de A en de Z. Yeah. Begin en het einde. I am the beginning and the end. Very important, I am. He doesn't say I have. I've had this, this discussion with uh, Jehovah Witnesses because they believe Jesus was created by God, which means he has a beginning. But he doesn't say I have an Alpha, I have a beginning. He says I am. And what he read from Colossians, he was before all things. But they will say that's a mistranslation, but anyway. So, okay. He said this first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. What is the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet? Aleph, Taf. So basically here in Greek it says Alpha, Omega. So it's not so meaningless. It's not so meaningless. And so we find it throughout the Old Testament. But you might find two of the same sentences in the Old Testament saying the same thing. And in one sentence you might find the Aleph Taf, and in the other sentence it means exactly the same, it's missing. So you see that grammatically it's not necessary. Um, there is a, a very interesting thing if you go through the book of Ruth, for example, you will find the name of Ruth, and every time you find the name of Ruth, it's just giving the name. But as soon as he's bought free by Boaz, who is a, a picture of the Messiah, and Ruth is a picture of the church, who is redeemed. As soon as that happens from then on, the rest of the book of Ruth, every time her name appears, it has Aleph Tav in front. See, so the, these are things that we, we don't read it in our translations, we have no clue that it's there, but these are all these, these treasures that God has put there, and it shows that nothing is by chance. So why is it here? That's the question. The Aleph, I already said what it means. It's actually telling the story of the Gospel. But what is the Taf? The Taf, the word Taf means mark. Mark, merkteken. So, how, did, how does that go together? There's the ancient shape of the, the Taf. This is new Hebrew, but the very old uh, primitive text. The tough looks like this. It's the cross. So we know that Jesus is the way from, from the earth to heaven. It's, it's the way. He made it possible through his, through his sacrifice on the cross. He was nailed to the cross. Now there is another meaning to the, the Aleph. also has an old, old style depiction and it's this. too much. Uh, actually, it's like this. Uh, it, these are the horns of an ox. That's what it is, an ox. Aleph is it's an ox. Which is, in the Old Testament, it's a sacrificial animal. So, that's what it also says. All that is, is in Aleph Taf. But it's also the beginning and the end. So, what is interesting, why is it here? Because here we have only the word end. Why is it connected to this is now vaet? And this is et, vaet. Why is it there? Here we have basically Jesus with the nail, and here we have without. Now in this, I said in the beginning, God has given his whole plan here. 
it is seven words. This is also a timeline of the history of God with man. When he says in um, Genesis uh, 6, my, uh, my struggle with man will not be forever. I will give him 120 days. This is before the flood comes. You see, usually we take this literal, so people will not grow older than 120, which at large it's so, actually. Um, but it points actually to man, mankind. It's the same word in Hebrew. Adam, it's man, but it's also mankind. I will not strive with mankind for more than 120 years. What are these years? These are jubilee years. 120 jubilee years is 6,000 years. So after the week is full, the six days of labor are full, the strive, then comes the Sabbath, the millennial reign, the thousand years that Jesus will reign on earth. That is what is in there. But it's already here. You'll say, how is that so? I'll tell you, it's a timeline. The first word, thousand, two thousand, not difficult, three, five thousand. <laughs> so you might say, okay, so what? When did Jesus come to the earth? In the year 4000. Jesus came, that was his first advent. And we would say it's not a year. 4,000, uh, what is the Hebrew year now? 5,779, so minus roughly 2,000, you don't add, come to 4,000. But that's because the calendars have changed. I'm not going into that now, but it was actually exactly the year 4,000. And we find it also in Exodus 12. Before the Exodus, God told Moses, uh, on the 10th of Nisan, set a lamb aside, without spot or blemish, and keep it until the 14th. There has never been a doubt in the, in the Hebrew um, history and, and tradition that this was a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. The 10th of, of Nisan, you keep it separate until the 14th. They knew it was the year 4000 would be the year. They knew this. And that's, by the way, why the calendar is why it's the way it is now, because if they would change it to its original uh, count, it would prove, or add proof to the fact that Jesus indeed was the Messiah. And they don't want this. So, Jesus' first advent was in the year 4000. When will he come again? In the year 6000, just before the millennium. But then he will bear the mark of the work that he has done. So here we have the Vav added to it. So this is how God works. So precise he is. Jesus is the substance of our faith. It comes out right away. It comes out again and again and again and again. By the way, did the, I said the Aleph tells his story. How many Alephs are there in this verse? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six. <laughs> Just saying. Beautiful verse. Has everything. If you get this, if you believe this, it's all you need to know. I wouldn't throw away the rest of the Bible. But, uh, <laughs> it's too valuable. But our faith has to be in Jesus. He's the only way. And he did the work. It's been completed. And um, this first we begin with, he is the image of the invisible God. It is, this is a gift that God gave us an image. Um, we are very uh, physical beings and um, we, our nature is first seeing and then believing. Well, God gave us his son to see. And we have to put our faith in him. And um, then, we will get there what, what King David writes. Uh, we will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives. And we'll be able to behold His beauty and to inquire in His temple. 
Amen.